I'm sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulties here. Here we go. Okay, um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are going to be uh, discussing the Fisheries Innovation Fund and the 2016 request for proposals uh, under which we are currently accepting pre-proposal applications. Uh, my name is Kristen Byler. I uh, manage our fisheries conservation programs here at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, and I'm going to be running you through the webinar today. Um, but I do want to take a moment to introduce a few other people um, that will be uh, helping me run the webinar today. Um, firstly, uh, Courtney McGeechy. Uh, she's our coordinator of our coastal and marine conservation programs here at NIFWF. Uh, she's basically going to help keep me in line uh, and answer all of your questions, help to organize all of the questions that you guys have. We we'll also have Will Jackson uh, will be joining us probably a little bit later into the presentation. Um, and Will is uh, the manager of our grants, administrators, uh, grants administration program here at NIFWF, and he is our easy grants guru. So he's really the one that uh, can answer any of the really specific questions that you guys may have about the application process itself. So I encourage you all to take advantage of uh, him being here for those uh, application questions. Okay. Um, so before we, we dive in, I just want to quickly run through the agenda for the webinar today. Hopefully we'll run about an hour, depending on how many questions you guys have. Um, the goal here is really to, to give a broad overview of the program and a little, uh, a little history and context, but really to dive into the priorities um, for this year's RFP and other funding priorities that are also, um, excuse me, other funding uh, opportunities that are also available through other programs to make sure that you can understand whether um, your particular proposal is most appropriate for the Fisheries Innovation Fund or potentially for another um, funding opportunity. And then we will take some time to go through the actual application process itself um, before ending with uh, hopefully a, a large amount of time for, for any questions. I will probably also be pausing several times throughout the presentation um, to see if there are any pressing questions uh, before we move on to, um, like, between categories, basically. Um, okay, but before we do any of that, I just want to orient you guys to go to webinar. For those of you who have not used it before, uh, basically you should see a um, kind of a control panel on the right side of your screen, uh, which you can minimize by clicking on this um, arrow, uh, orange arrow here. Uh, you'll note that all of you guys are on mute right now. Um, and uh, so basically that means if you want to ask any questions, you're going to need to do so through the question panel. So you can write in comments or questions at any time as you think of them. And then kind of once we hit a critical mass of, of write-in questions, we will uh, go ahead and pause and, and walk through those one by one. Um, at various points, though, we recognize some questions are going to be more complex and will obviously be easier to ask verbally. So uh, when directed, we'll open up a few sessions to allow you guys to uh, virtually raise your hands, which basically means um, you can kind of click on this little icon here with the hand, um, and that will notify us that you have a question, and Courtney will go ahead and take you off mute so you can ask it to the group. Um, I also want to mention that um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted um, to the Fisheries Innovation Fund website uh, after, uh, after we're done here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into a brief overview of the program. Um, the Fisheries Innovation Fund uh, was founded by um, the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation in cooperation with uh, NOAA Fisheries, the Walton Family Foundation, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And the um, fund was launched back in 2010 with the goal of really trying to foster new and innovative ideas to help fishermen and fishing communities implement sustainable fisheries strategies throughout the United States. Um, so this has been a broad, comprehensive project program that has um, had five years of really successful and uh, uh, really fantastic projects. We've, uh, in total, we've funded 78 grants, um, totaling $8.1 million in total funding over that five-year period. And as you can see, those grants have really um, taken place throughout the country in a wide range of different types of fisheries. Uh, and several of these projects have even been national in scope or focused on multiple uh, fishing regions. Um, so the, in addition to wide geographic scope of the program, 
And the program has also focused on a wide number of different types of innovations that hit on um, a, a large number of different priority areas. And so for those of you who are familiar with the Fisheries Innovation Fund or have maybe applied in the past, uh, you may have noticed that this year's RFP looks a little bit different than in years prior. Um, previously, we had have always had five main funding priorities. This year, we've kind of knocked that down to three main funding priorities, these uh, being capacity building, market development, differentiation, and recreational fisheries. These have always been key priorities for the program and will continue to be the priorities solicited through this 2016 RFP. Um, but you'll notice that there are two priorities that um, we have funded in the past that we will not be funding this year for the main reason that we want to try and reduce any redundancies in our funding because we have these new excellent opportunities available and we want to make sure that um, programs are, projects are applying to um, the funding opportunity that best uh, represents their particular project, which would hopefully make your project, uh, that project potentially more competitive because it's being put into a funding opportunity that's a bit more specific. So, what does all that mean? Um, basically, I'm going to run through these three uh, key priorities um, in capacity building, market development, and recreational fishing later in the presentation. I'll go through those in much more detail. But I do want to just take a few minutes to explain why we are not accepting proposals under the bycatch reduction and on electronic technology sections anymore and, uh, and what that means for you. So first related to bycatch reduction, in years past, uh, we have funded a wide range of uh, different types of strategies to reduce bycatch. And these included um, kind of uh, collaborative approaches, uh, community-based incentive programs. The, a classical example of this might be a risk pool or a bycatch avoidance network. Um, so these kind of non-gear-based innovations to reduce bycatch. And this year, we are absolutely still interested in innovations in that space. It's just this year, we've kind of rolled up that bycatch reduction into this broader capacity building um, priority. So in that way, we will still be treating bycatch reduction as an important priority this year. But what's different this year is that we will no longer be considering proposals um, that focus on fishing gear engineering or fishing gear efficiency. Okay, so any gear-related project uh, will, is no longer uh, eligible under this year's Fisheries Innovation Fund. And instead, we would suggest that people interested in, in submitting proposals in that space uh, look into NOAA's Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program. Uh, that program should be um, releasing an RSP soon. And um, basically, that program is designed with the explicit purpose of um, uh, pushing forward innovations in a gear, uh, fishing gear engineering. Okay, so again, it's just kind of a slight shift, but bycatch reduction as a whole is still a priority for the Fisheries Innovation Fund. Now turning to electronic technologies, um, in years past we have funded a wide range of kind of small scale pilot projects that looked at electronic monitoring and electronic te um, reporting technologies. Um, and Last year, we were able to launch a brand new uh, funding opportunity called the Electronic Monitoring and Reporting Grant Program. And so instead of soliciting um, proposals in this space through the Fisheries Innovation Fund, instead, we're asking that any, uh, any people who are interested in submitting proposals that have a focus on electronic monitoring or reporting wait and apply to this Electronic Monitoring and Reporting Grant Program. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Electronic Monitoring and Reporting Grant Program, which we call EMR for short, because I know that's a mouthful. Um, so the EMR program was developed just last year um, in partnership with NOAA in order to catalyze the implementation of various electronic technologies um, for catch monitoring in U.S. fisheries. And so this RFP is not currently available, but it will be um, uh, released within the next few months here. We're expecting it uh, probably late February or early March, and we will send out a broad announcement uh, so that you can be made aware um, of this opportunity once it becomes available. But again, if you are um, 
thinking about proposing a project that has um, a focus on electronic monitoring and reporting, again, just wait um, for this EMR uh, grant program RFP to come out here soon. And I understand that in you know certain cases there might be some gray areas or you might just need a little bit more information to figure out um, what is most appropriate for your specific project. So if that's the case, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. Um, my contact information is here at the bottom of the screen, and I'd be happy to talk to you about this in a little bit more detail to see um, which opportunity is, is most appropriate for your particular project. Okay, so um, I just want to take a quick second um, to see if there are any questions, clarifying questions regarding eligibility for electronic monitoring and reporting. So Courtney, do we have any um, questions that have come through, uh, write-in questions? Currently, no, but maybe if we want to pause to give everyone a chance. If you have a question, please raise your hand or type in. And of course, please um, type in your questions as you think of them uh, at any point throughout the presentation. Okay. Well, um, we will, of course, have more uh, more options, for, more availability for you guys to ask ask questions. So um, keep thinking about them as we as we move through. But again, do not hesitate to reach out to me directly um, if you're a little unclear um, about the EMR program. Okay. So with that, I want to dive a bit deeper into this uh, 2016 RFP and the priorities under the Fisheries Innovation Fund. So first things first, um, I think you need to know where you can access the RFP. Um, so our website, the Fisheries Innovation Fund uh, website on NIFWIF, um, you can uh, come here to just get a little bit more general information about the program, but you'll see um, a panel on the uh, right side of the screen that includes some contact information as well as a link to the actual request for proposals. So um, as we go through these priorities, it's going to closely mirror, um, the, the presentation is going to closely mirror what is in the RFP. So if you want to have a copy in front of you uh, to make notes or anything, that might be helpful. Okay. Uh, so when you click on that hyperlink, you'll be taken to a new web page uh, the, with the actual request for proposals. Uh, if you'd prefer to have a uh, downloaded copy, um, there is a PDF version available here as well. Um, and so kind of the first thing you'll notice is that the pre-proposals are going to be due on Monday, February 8th. Um, and you'll also notice that we have a two-stage proposal process for the Fisheries Innovation Fund. So basically what that means is that um, we are currently accepting pre-proposal applications, which is just a short kind of summary of the project that's being proposed. And then we will review those pre-proposals to determine if they align well with the program priorities. Um, and then uh, based on that review, we will invite a subset of those pre-proposals applicants to uh, submit a full proposal, in which case we'll ask for um, considerably more information and detail about the project. Okay, and those won't be due until April. But for now, this uh, particular webinar is, is meant to focus on that pre-proposal uh, process stage, and again, those will be due on February 8th. Um, the other thing you'll notice uh, right off the bat when you look at the RFP is that we have about $1.2 million in available funding this year. Um, typically, we tend to fund between 10 to 15 projects a year, so we can expect similar um, this year. Okay, so um, to dive into the uh, eligibility for this program, it's pretty wide open for the Fisheries Innovation Fund. Basically, uh, everyone is eligible to apply with the exception of uh, U.S. federal government agencies. So that would include nonprofit organizations, um, state or local government agencies, Indian tribes, uh, universities, or other educational institutions. Um, and this also includes for-profit businesses. Um, and if you're not associated with any sort of business or uh, organization, you can also apply as an unincorporated individual. And then lastly, international organizations are eligible to apply. However, as we'll see in just a moment um, in the geography eligibility, 
the uh, proposal, the scope of work, needs to be within U.S. fisheries if it's an international organization in order to be eligible. So again, the ineligible entities are just uh, federal agencies, and that, in this case, that does include the Fisheries Management Council. Okay, um, now individual council members can potentially apply uh, through as a state representative or whatever the case may be, um, but the actual councils themselves uh, cannot apply for funding through this program. Okay, geographically, uh, it's also extremely wide open. All U.S. fisheries are eligible to apply. Okay, that includes commercial fisheries as well as recreational fisheries, state and federal fisheries. Okay, so we have, this includes all 50 states. It also includes the Great Lakes as well as all um, U.S. territories. It does not include uh, the freely associated states, um, so, but basically it's pretty, pretty wide open. All U.S. fisheries are eligible to apply. All right, the other thing um, that we'd like you to start thinking about as you're kind of scoping out your proposal and developing the pre-proposal is the kind of the scale um, that your project is being proposed at. All right, so really a project could fall into one of two categories. It could be in this kind of early development stage or the pilot phase where it's a brand new innovative idea or solution. It could be some sort of uh, hardware solution. It could be some sort of social innovation. But at any rate, it's at this very early stage where you're potentially developing a proof of concept. Um, you're beta testing. You are doing a small scale pilot project just to see if this idea will work. Okay? So that's one category. Then we'll also see proposals that are um, taking proven innovations, things that have already gone through this piloting phase, have already been tested and shown to be a successful um, fishery solution, and now those projects are ready to be implemented at scale. Okay, so that implementation could mean that you're going from a pilot project where you had five fishermen up to a implementation scale project where you have 30 fishermen, or maybe you're going from a project that had focused on one fishing community and expanding it to 10 fishing communities, or potentially you're taking an innovation that was developed say on the West Coast and you're wanting to apply it in a totally new context to a new fishery on the East Coast. Okay? So there are various ways in which you could have an implementation scale project, but basically the idea here and the, the thing that differentiates these two categories is just whether this is a brand new concept that need, still needs development and testing or whether this is a proven solution that is now ready for, uh, to be scaled up. Okay, so think about which one of these categories your project falls under. But in either case, we are interested in proposals in both of these categories and we are interested in proposals in all U.S. fisheries within these two categories. Okay. Now, the one um, kind of caveat to that is that if your project aims to implement a proven innovation, try and bring something to scale, um, then that project will be more pri more competitive and will be given priority if it occurs within one of four target fisheries. Okay. Now this is new this year, and the four target fisheries that we um, are going to be looking at are the New England ground fish fishery, the Gulf of Mexico reef fish fishery, the West Coast ground fish fishery, and the Gulf of Alaska ground fish fisheries. Okay? But I want to stress that implementation scale projects that fall outside of these target fisheries are still eligible to apply. Okay? It's just simply that projects within one of these four target fisheries are likely to be more competitive uh, in this year's round um, of the fund. Okay? Now those development scale projects uh, implementing, uh, innovating a brand new concept, there are no uh, geographic priorities at that scale. Okay? Now I imagine you guys probably have questions about this, so please type them in as you're thinking of them, uh, and we will pause um, for uh, verbal questions as well in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to just go ahead and run through uh, the program priorities in a little bit more detail. Okay, so as I had mentioned before, this year um, the RFP focuses on three main priority areas. 
uh, each of these having um, several subcategories uh, underneath them. So these are capacity building, market development, and recreational fisheries. Um, so the first of which being capacity building. This one is probably the most broad um, of all of the priorities and has a, a five different kind of subcategories um, within it. So the first of which being projects that work towards improving the economic viability and efficiency of fishing businesses. So this might be the kind of project that develops technical assistance for fishermen in order to help them diversify or stabilize their incomes, for instance. We'd also be interested in projects that build capacity in order to retain access to fisheries resources. Um, so some classical examples of ways to do this would include uh, regional fishing associations or the development of permit banks or quota banks, uh, community trusts, or things of that nature. Uh, we'd also be interested in projects that uh, can build a community's capacity to potentially develop a sustainability plan or um, to develop an uh, individual business's capacity through, through business plan or marketing development. Um, and this one is also uh, tried to be written broad enough to include information sharing and outreach types of um, capacity building efforts as well. So this might include um, a workshop series or uh, conferences or things of that nature that are, are trying to, to build capacity around a particular topic. Um, running with the theme of trying to um, maintain access and increase participation in fisheries, uh, we are also interested in projects that can develop innovative solutions to promote intergenerational fishery access and entry level access. And then lastly, um, as I said, bycatch reduction is still a priority this year. Uh, and we are certainly interested in proposals that work towards building capacity for these um, sort of community-based and um, incentive-based uh, bycatch reduction strategies that can allow fishermen to uh, fully utilize their annual catch limits. Um, so examples of this would be things like uh, bycatch hotspot mapping, avoidance networks, or risk pools. Um, the second uh, main priority area is market development, and I think this one is pretty um, self-explanatory. Basically, this is looking for uh, any projects that can facilitate market innovation. So some examples of this would be differentiated marketplaces or forward contracting marketplaces, uh, anything that might be able to diversify revenue, value-added products, uh, potentially opening up new markets uh, by um, ex exploring underutilized species. Uh, so any, anything that basically creates some sort of market innovation. And these types of projects could occur anywhere throughout the supply chain from the harvesters to the consumers. Uh, we'd also be interested in projects that can um, develop market innovations through the implementation of seafood traceability strategies. Okay, and last priority would be um, supporting innovations in the recreational fishing sector. Um, so here there are, again, two kind of subcategories, the first of which being to improve monitoring and evaluation. Uh, so these might be things like uh, finding new strategies or more efficient or effective strategies for dockside validation surveys or uh, private angler intercept surveys, things of that nature. But in this case, we are not looking for um, electronic reporting or e-log type projects. If you're looking to develop some sort of app or um, to develop a, a new way of uh, like a new e-log or something of that nature, then um, you'd want to wait and apply under the electronic monitoring and reporting grant program in that case. Um, the second uh, kind of area under recreational fishing uh, would be to support outreach and research activities in the sector. So this might be um, strategies to improve uh, best management practices or best handling practices, um, things that can reduce post-release mortality, um, so things that might reduce barotrauma, for instance. Uh, or anything that might uh, kind of outreach activities that could bolster anglers' involvement in um, in utilizing these best conservation practices and best handling practices. Um, 
Now, if you are interested in applying um, under this priority area, then I would strongly encourage you to um, look at the links that are available in the RFP under those priorities. Um, these are we've provided two links uh, to uh, NOAA Fisheries documents and plans that they've developed uh, that include um, description of some of the, their key strategies and the proposals that um, kind of align with these strategies or could potentially support these strategies are likely to be more competitive uh, within this priority area. Okay, so as a kind of a recap of the um, RFP, again, we have these three key priorities that we are looking for this year. We will not be looking for electronic monitoring reporting. Again, go to EMR. All U.S. fisheries are eligible to apply, and we want you to begin to start thinking about whether your project is at the development stage or the implementation stage. And if it is at the imp implementation stage, priority will be given to the four fisheries listed here. Okay, so I'm going to leave this kind of synopsis on the screen, and we're going to go ahead and pause here uh, to take any questions. Uh, we'll go through the written questions first, and then uh, if you would like to ask a question verbally, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, we will we'll go through that. Um, now, so Courtney, do we have any questions? We do. We have quite a few, actually. The first is, are subsistence fisheries eligible to apply? I loosely understand that to also mean artisanal, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, subsistence fisheries would certainly be eligible to apply. Um, I would imagine, I mean, it depends on the scope of work. Projects that um, are able to, um, you know, really directly engage uh, the, the fishing community and engage a larger number of the fishing community are likely to be more competitive. Um, so it just I guess it depends on the, the scale of the fishery to which you're referring. But yes, they are eligible to apply. Okay, the next question is, would evaluation of existing innovative techniques with the objective of making improvements be of interest to the FIF program? Okay, hang on. I'm going to have to read that one. <laughs> if I can get to it, I'm having trouble accessing it, actually. <laughs> so hang on. Oh, I see it now. Okay, just a minute. Let me get myself oriented here. I'm sorry, guys. Um, oh, I don't know where you're looking, Courtney. I'm sorry. And you, it is, can you tell me let's see. It what is. time it was asked, maybe? Sure. Um, the timestamp is 326. 326. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, potentially. Um, so, again, the question here being centered around evaluation of uh, technique, you know, innovative techniques that have potentially already been tested and seeing that they're truly as effective as they maybe. Um, claim to be. Um, yes, I'd say that the, they are certainly eligible to apply. Um, again, I think you'd need to make a strong case for um, how this type of proposal um, could, will be utilized and what the kind of the long-term um, goals of that sort of evaluation would be. Um, but yeah, potentially under the right circumstances, that sort of project could, um, could be of interest to the, to the fund. Okay. The next question is, can you expand on what the traceability would entail? I believe that was maybe a slide or two ago. Yeah. So um, basically, um, you know, seafood traceability is, is pretty broad and could include any number of things. Now, if you're talking about, um, you know, placing along the supply chain, so for instance, um, might be a U.S. market. Um, but it might be shipped overseas, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, again, we would want a strong nexus with the U.S. fisheries here. Um, so if the project is aimed at supporting um, the U.S. fishing communities and to um, increase uh, market opportunities for those U.S. fishermen, then even if those uh, product is ultimately shipped overseas, that would be... Um, that, that would be an eligible project. Um, in terms of, you know, obviously in the traceability space, there are um, hardware and kind of software uh, innovations that are being developed and probably will continue to be developed 
um, as well as um, kind of capacity building sort of level things that would be associated with properly implementing uh, and associated outreach um, to, to have people use the traceability tool properly. Um, so anything in this space, whether it be kind of at the capacity building, social innovation side of traceability, or in the actual nitty gritty developing the technology and the associated software would be eligible to apply. I don't know if that fully answers your question, um, but I'd be certainly, certainly would be happy to, to speak with you offline um, if you have kind of some more targeted questions about that. Okay, so the next question is, would NIFWIF be more or less likely to support the expansion of a project that had already been funded as a pilot um, through the FIF program several years ago? Uh, potentially, um, but not necessarily, right? So if um, a pilot project uh, was funded externally, um, yet it has strong data to support it and shows that it was um, a, a successful pilot project and is ready, uh, for implementation scale, um, then I'd say that would be just as competitive as a proposal that um, had previously used NIFWIS funding in order to do that pilot, pilot study. Okay, um, next we have a clarification question. Um, can pilot demonstration project proposals be applied to areas outside the program priority geographic areas? Yes. Um, so, um, all, again, let me go back here, all U.S. fisheries are eligible to apply under either the implementation um, scale or the kind of pilot scale, okay? It's, so under that development scale, no priority is going to be given whether it's in the New England groundfish fishery or the New England scallop fishery, for instance, okay? But if, if the project is implementation scale, then um, between those two fisheries, the New England groundfish fishery would potentially be more competitive and be given priority. Okay, um, the next question is, are areas that have already received a NIFWF grant more or less likely to receive another? So geographically, it seems like. Sure, well beyond these um, kind of four target fisheries that we've identified, there's not uh, any um, particular fishery or geographic area that we are more or less focused on. Um, so uh, it really, each each year, we kind of roll the dice fresh um, and we get a, a completely new batch of proposals. And so we don't, um, you know, we d and we don't know where that next really amazing innovative idea might come from. Um, so we don't want to, uh, to limit um, that kind of early scale development in any way um, by limiting or thinking ahead of time about which uh, geography or fishery might be most appropriate. Um, but at the implementation scale, um, you know, we are, we have over the last five years supported a lot of projects that have developed really cool innovations and other funders, funders have also um, funded um, a lot of, a lot of projects that have developed some really interesting innovations. And I think some of those innovations are starting to become to come to a place where they can be implemented at scale. And so within those strategies, we want to try and um, support their implementation within those priority geographies, uh, fisheries that we mentioned. Okay, let's see. Um, should you specifically align your project with one priority, one priority area um, or one sub-priority within that area? Not necessarily. Uh, so we recognize that many proposals are going to span multiple priority areas. Um, and so uh, it, it is not necessarily going to, to strengthen uh, the proposal one way or the other if it's focused on five priorities, uh, like, you know, five of the sub-priorities or just one. Um, but if, if it is focused on multiple priorities, you just want to make sure that in the proposal you're very clear um, about how the scope of work will address each one of those priorities. Okay, the next question is, how many applicants submit on average? Yeah, so we, um, we, we tend not to give out too much detailed information on this, but I can say it is a, a very competitive pro program. Uh, last year we got about $19 million in requests. Uh, we only had about 
$1.5 million in available funding. So that gives you uh, a rough sense um, of the fact that this is, in fact, an incredibly competitive program. We tend to award between 10 to 15 projects uh, each year. And in this, in this year, we have $1.2 million in funding available. OK, next is, could a project couple with an aquaculture company for an innovation? Yes, so um, yes, aquaculture, um, AmeriCulture, that is absolutely uh, eligible to apply, um, you know, spe potentially especially under the um, market innovations category and re revenue diversification. Um, so I definitely say those proposals are um, eligible to apply. I think, um, you know, wild caught fisheries may uh, overall be a bit more competitive, or at least those are the types of proposals we get more frequently. Um, but that is not to say that a, um, a you know, the right kind of aquaculture project wouldn't be um, wouldn't be considered, and it is certainly eligible. Okay, the next question is. Oh. Okay, what category should you apply for if you are currently in the pilot program and or launching while this application process is going on? Yeah, well, I think it would depend on the, the scope of work that you're proposing. Um, and, uh, you know, if the goal of the project is to take it, to, to move that process along, to go from that uh, early stage implementation into the later phases of the implementation process, then I would say you would that kind of project would fall under the kind of implementation scale. Uh, I, I don't know if that addresses your question. If it doesn't, you can kind of pay to follow up. Okay. Will proposals to bring new processing technology to fishing communities to promote marketability of underutilized species be considered? Yes, um, we um, <laughs> detecting a theme here. Yes is is oftentimes the answer because, as you notice, all of these priorities are pretty broad than the way that they're written, right? Um, and and again, the the reason for that is the fact that in innovation can come out of out of any space. Um, Traditionally, um, we have uh, we have funded projects at the kind of harvester level probably more frequently, but that's not to say we, we have definitely um, supported projects uh, at the processing level and um, new processing techniques for underutilized species. So um, the you know if the, if the proposal um, provides a strong scope of work and can and clearly demonstrate that there is a um, market opportunity there um, and the scope of work is really needs to be centered at the processor, um, then they would be eligible to apply. Okay. Would software um, or hardware for traceability be better um, saved for the EMR application process or best used here? I think that case is best used here. So I, I think that um, brings up a, a good point. There are obviously a wide range of different types of electronic technologies that are out there, right? Like a business planning tool that's um, online could be considered an electronic technology or a traceability system. Again, that would be considered um, an electronic technology. But for the electronic monitoring and reporting grant program, really that's focused on just that electronic monitoring, whether that be video based or our yeah, RFIDs or whatever the case may be, um, and then uh, electronic reporting being e logs, um, things of that nature. And again, this would be for uh, pr pr the primary focus being on fisheries dependent data collection. Um, so, in the case of traceability, uh, the electronic technologies that support traceability are really there to um, develop uh, new market opportunities. Uh, and so that would be more appropriate for the Fisheries Innovation Fund. Can projects like community outreach and workshops that aim to build capacity on fishery policy be funded? Um, yes, potentially, but we have to be a little bit careful here. We cannot fund any advocacy or any lobbying activities. So if um, it is a purely education-based campaign, um, where you're just trying to, to, for instance, help recreational fishers understand how to reduce post-release mortality. And the idea is just to purely provide education or in workshops that can provide that education, then that would be an allowable use of funds. 
uh, if there's any um, aspect of advocacy or lobbying, then NIFWIF funds cannot be used to support those efforts. Okay, the next question is, what is the time frame for the work to be completed? So, as we would call yeah. it, project period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get into some of the logistics of the actual application process um, uh, momentarily, but projects typically range between one to two years. Can you be more specific on what you are looking for regarding recreational fisheries? Sure. Um, so um, I think uh, I, would, I would definitely encourage whoever asked that question to, to look at the NOAA links provided as well, because I will just provide a little bit more context and additional information. Um, but um, again, here for monitoring and evaluation, obviously a large component of that in the recreational fishing space um, may include electronic technology. So for that particular sub-priority, uh, you want to think um, very hard about whether it's an electronic based technology um, and, and in that case you'd, you'd want to wait. But there are some monitoring and evaluation innovations um, that um, may be necessary that don't necessarily include a um, EMER component. So, um, you know, private angler intercept surveys for instance are, you know, there are um, obviously some some challenges associated with collecting those data. Um, and so if there are strategies um, that can either help at the uh, private English side of things or at the uh, management side of things, whatever the case may be, um, to, to kind of help uh, improve the efficiency, um, the timeliness in which those data are collected to improve and enhance monitoring and evaluation, um, those are the types of projects that would certainly be of benefit. Um, you might, we've, we've, in the past, uh, we have funded, um, in, the, in the recreational space, we've, we've funded a few projects that have looked at uh, uh, implementing pilot projects that would develop a quota system in the charter route fleet, for instance. Uh, we've looked at uh, barotrauma research and ways in which um, we can re reduce uh, post-release mortality. Um, and then we've um, also funded projects that have figured out best handling practices in a fishery uh, done a lot of survey work trying to figure out exactly what um, uh, you know, what people are what what are common practices and which are practices that are maybe um, not very effective or, or re lead to high mortality um, and so and then developing kind of these best practices guides that are really accessible to the general public that people and then kind of helping those uh, private anglers or uh, people going out on charter boats. Um, to uh, to really start implementing these conservation practices. So in the past, those are the types of projects that we have supported. Um, but you know, the innovation in this space could could come from anywhere, and really, we want to be able to try and find the types of projects that can improve um, monitoring efficiency as well as uh, handling practices and outreach to the actual private angler community. Okay, so related to the recreational fishery, um, is it appropriate to submit innovative bycatch reduction gear um, as a part of the recreational fishery priority? Um, the project would include outreach and education. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in when, in the, the recreational case, you know, if, if we're talking about like um, ascending devices or things like that that um, can reduce barotrauma, um, you know, in the context of recreational fisheries, and if it's being developed as a strategy, as a comprehensive outreach project, then I think that would fall under this. If the idea is just to test the efficiency of the gear itself, then I don't think FIF is the right place. And, and again, you should probably look to NOAA's um, EREP program for that. Okay, can fishery revitalization plans for municipality be proposed for communities with debilitated or non-existent fisheries? Oh, um, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I don't see why they couldn't. Um, uh, you know, obviously you'd need to make a, a strong case for how the proposed scope of work would make significant strides towards making that fishery viable. Um, at some point in the in the, ideally the near future, I would imagine. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of an interesting special case, and I'd be happy to, to speak with you about it, um, get a little bit more details on exactly what, what you're referring to um, offline. So feel free to shoot me an email if you'd like to discuss that further. But uh, at that kind of very basic level that you just asked the question at, I would, I would imagine that, yes, it would be eligible. Okay. Next, um, we have a financial question. So based on 1.2 million per 10 projects, which equals about 120K per project, the question is, is this total amount, is this the total amount whether it is a one or two year project or will you get 120K per year, basically? Um, so there, it's not going to be divided evenly. So um, as we go through the um, proposal process, uh, you'll see that one step is to include the requested amount for the project. Um, and so typically um, projects tend to range between about $50,000 to $200,000, but we don't have an upper or, or lower limit. So you could come in um, above that if, if need be. Um, but um, competitive proposals tend to range between fifty dollars to $200,000. And, um, and so, you know, really it just de depends on the, the mix of proposals as to whether we'll um, to be able to support 10 or 15, just kind of depending on what the request amounts come in at. Uh, so it will not be divided divided evenly. Uh, it's just going to be the budget you should the budget you propose should align directly with the um, outcomes and the activities that you're proposing. Okay, the next question is, are projects that focus on biological data collection by fishermen eligible or are they more suited for the EMR RFP? So, um, I, well, I guess it would, that one might, I might need a little bit more information to be able to really answer that question, but um, I guess it'd be dependent on the way that those data are collected. So if it's fisheries independent data, um, uh, you know, uh, then if it's and it's being collected with uh, electronic technologies such as uh, e-logs or through um, you know some sort of sensor on the boat or video, um, then I would think that would be better suited for EMR. Um, uh, I, but I guess if the data is you know kind of being collected through maybe like a creel survey or something like that, then uh, it may fall more under like kind of capacity building. So I think I just maybe need a little bit more information to to be able to answer that adequately. So um, I would encourage you to, to follow up with me uh, on email um, and I'd be happy to kind of dive into that a little bit deeper to understand your question. Okay, um, the next question is, if, if a proposal is written that uses methods to investigate mortality that have been pr previously used in commercial fisheries but now will be applied to recreational fisheries, would this be considered a pilot project? Um, you know, I mean, some of these cases are going to be a little bit of a judgment call, right? Um, I think if it's going to be a real major overhaul um, of the system in order to make it conform to a recreational fishery, then, you know, that will require beta testing. That will require um, kind of proof of concept. And so I think that would put it in the kind of development space. Um, but if it's a, a pretty cut and, you know, kind of cut and paste sort of thing where you can more directly apply it, um, to the recreational sector um, and you can kind of hit the ground running, then it might be at an implementation scale. So I think it just depends. Um, all right, but I think, um, I imagine there's probably many more questions, but I, I'm tr trying to keep an eye to the time and the fact that we would still like to be able to go through um, the application process at least a little bit. Um, and so, you know, if you have any specific questions about uh, your particular project and whether it's eligible, um, by all means, email me. I'd be happy to, to talk through it with you, okay? Um, so uh, I just want to, but I do want to move on. Um, so if you do have additional questions, try and keep them uh, a little bit more general and questions that um, are not necessarily related to your specific scope of work, but that would um, apply to the program as a whole and, and everyone on the call today, okay? And if you have specific questions, again, follow up with me independently. Okay, so um, in the actual application process, I'm going to try to go through this uh, pretty quickly here. Um, but again, it's a two-stage process. Um, we are uh, right now seeking uh, pre-proposals, so that's what I'm going to kind of run through that process now. Um, first things first, you're 
what's going to want to know where you can go to get more information. So on the uh, Fisheries Innovation Fund RFP webpage, um, there is a link here for a tip sheet. Um, and this is a uh, document that you can download that gives you kind of a step-by-step -step guide um, through the application process. So I strongly encourage you to download this document and have it next to you as you're going through the application. Okay, um, now we use an online um, application system called Easy Grants, and this is where all of the uh, application material will be submitted. Okay? Um, and you can access Easy Grants. Um, there are links in the um, tip sheet, there are links in the RFP, and it's just easygrants.nifwith.org. Uh, Okay, so first things first, you're going to want to obviously log in. Um, if you have not registered before, go ahead and register. Um, and once you've done that, you'll be taken to this sort of home screen um, that allows you to apply for funding. Uh, for those of you who have applied it in the past, you might notice that Easy Grants looks a little bit different. Uh, we just had a uh, upgrade late last year, um, and so the functionality remains largely the same, uh, but things look a little bit different. So once you've logged in and you go to this home page, you can click on this Apply for Funding link here, which will uh, bring you to a list of all of the funding opportunities that are currently available um, through NIFWIF. And of course, you'll want to click on the Fisheries Innovation Fund opportunity. Uh, and once you do that, then you can click Apply to actually start your pre-proposal application. Now, you will be prompted to uh, complete a quick eligibility quiz. It's just three questions. Um, it, it's not, not a big deal. It usually um, isn't an issue in any way. But if for some reason you uh, don't pass that eligibility quiz, you will not be um, allowed to submit a, a pre-proposal. So if that happens to you and you feel like it was done in error, um, then shoot us an email and we can uh, take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so once you have successfully applied for funding and started your pre-proposal application, um, you will now have a task available to you on your My Tasks section of Easy Grants. Um, and you'll have a link that uh, you can click on to actually get into the pre-proposal and complete it. And you'll notice that um, each section of the pre-proposal has this kind of instructions section at the top that kind of walks you through the process. Um, there is also technical assistance available uh, via email and through a uh, voicemail um, hotline that you can also call. Um, and so there's basically uh, six um, steps that you'll need to go through when submitting the pre-proposal. Um, and those are kind of shown here uh, in this, this red box. Um, we're just going to run through those quickly. Uh, first, contact information, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, self-explanatory. Organization information, uh, here you can go in and select your organization if, um, if your organization has ever applied to any grant at NIFWF, uh, grant program at NIFWF before. You should be able to find your organization on the list or you can add your organization anew. Um, the next tab is this project information section. Um, and here's where I'm going to stress you really want to use that tip sheet because it provides some specific details um, about each one of these categories. But this is where you're going to start to provide some specific information about the actual project itself. You're going to want to give it a title, and that title should be descriptive. It should be relatively short, and it should be distinguishable. So Fisheries Innovation Fund pre-proposal uh, is a, not a great title. Uh, we want something that um, is immediately distinguishable. So this is a, just one example of a previous grant um, with a great title. It's basically, it shows very clearly exactly what they aim to do, where they aim to do it, and what the long-term outcome will be from this project. Okay, this is where you put in the project period. Um, again, these typically range from one to two years. Um, project description, this should be a, this should be brief, two sentences max. Uh, it should start with an action verb, and uh, the second sentence should start with project will. Okay, so um, main point here, this section should be a very brief two-line synopsis of your project. Um, the abstract is where you can then provide a little bit more um, detail, and you want to start that out with the name of your organization, will do dot, dot, dot. Um, you want to give a succinct project location description. Again, this doesn't need to be complete sentences. It shouldn't be uh, very long. It should be straight to the point exactly where the project will take place. 
Um, and then here's where you put in the uh, requested amount. And again, projects typically range between $50 to $200,000. Okay, the most, probably most important section um, of the proposal is this upload section because this is where you are going to actually upload your narrative where you describe the scope of work. Um, the way uh, that you'll do this is you'll, you'll see here in this red box, um, there is a pre-proposal narrative template that's available for download. So this is a Word document that you can download from the system, save it locally, work on it on your leisure. Once you feel like it's ready to go, then um, you come, will log back into Easy Grants, and then this upload section, you'll go ahead and upload the completed um, narrative back into the system. All right, the actual um, narrative template, here's an example of what it looks like. Um, please use this template. Um, that really helps us out. Um, this, uh, you know, the instructions are provided here, um, it, but it does look a little bit different um, than in years past, so I'm just going to quickly hit the high points here. Um, it's short, two pages max. Um, again, this is just a summary of your project um, to see if uh, it's um, going to be submitted uh, to see if you'll be invited to submit a full proposal, in which case you'll be able to provide a lot more detail about the project. So you want this to be concise. Um, you, uh, we do ask that you keep the basic formatting. Uh, however, obviously this, all this text takes up a lot of space, so um, you can delete the, the text here. We just ask that you keep the outline format and the headings uh, intact. Okay, the first part of the narrative is just kind of some basic background information, uh, and the second part is where you're going to actually spend the detail talking about the methods, activities, and outcomes. So the first part, um, this should be short. Do not take up a whole bunch of your two-page limit on this section. Okay, each one of these areas should be could be answered in no more than one to two sentences. And enough, in many cases, they don't even require a complete sentence. So please try to keep this brief. Um, the idea here is to, to identify which priority, your priority or priorities your project addresses from the 2016 RFP um, to describe kind of that category, the project scale. Is this at innovation, new innovation development scale, or is it an implementation scale project? Um, you can just put innovation or implementation, and then maybe one sentence um, for uh, a little bit of context if it's needed. Um, you want to go ahead and indicate which fishery or fisheries your proposal focuses on. So this would include both target fisheries and bycatch fisheries. Um, and then um, if your project focuses on um, a wide geographic area or is national or doesn't focus on any particular fishery, you can also indicate that here. Under participants, uh, here what we're really looking for is uh, we're just trying to get a sense of the scale of the project. So is this um, project that's going to be working with a single fishing community and maybe just a few fishermen, or is this going to be a project that's going to be working in an entire fishery, a whole sector, um, or um, with uh, a larger number of uh, fishermen? Um, so just w we don't need a ton of detail here. We don't need exact numbers here, but we just want to get a rough sense of exactly how many fishermen you tend to engage, hope to engage in this project directly and how many fishing communities will be engaged if that's applicable. And then, uh, again, a brief description of project location. The second part of the narrative, again, this is where you should spend the most of your uh, word count. Um, and this is where you're going to describe in detail, uh, well, in <laughs> relative detail, the um, methods um, that you'll use to achieve the uh, overall outcomes that you hope to um, achieve with this proposal and the activities that will support those outcomes. Okay, so once you've completed the narrative and uploaded it into the system, then you can also um, complete the matching contributions section. Um, now, for the Fisheries Innovation Fund, match uh, is not required, um, but it is certainly encouraged. A proposal that can bring match um, is definitely going to be more competitive. Okay, so in order to um, uh, provide information about the matching sources, um, you can just, um, of course, click Add um, and include as many matching sources and matching contribution as you have. Um, and um, there are a few categories that you'll note. This could be in-kind match. Uh, this could be cash uh, 
uh, as well. Okay, so there are different types of uh, match can, that can be provided. Um, and then um, there's also different status that you, you can indicate what status you are in ac acquiring those funds. So if you are um, have uh, applied to another funding source, uh, but you have not yet received word um, about whether you received that funding or not, you can still put it down as a matching um, contribution, but you'll just want to indicate that it's an application or that you intend to apply for this funding opportunity. Okay? Um, so uh, you can, like I said, you can fill out as many uh, sources of matching contributions as you feel like you have for the project, uh, but these need to be non-federal matching contributions. Okay, so federal match cannot be counted for uh, the Fisheries Innovation Fund. Okay, and then once you've done that, then you're pretty much done. Uh, those are all the stages, and you want to go to this review and submit section uh, in Easy Grants. And once you've completed everything successfully, you'll see green marks across the board. And once you get that, you'll be given the option to actually submit the proposal. Do not forget to hit the submit button. Oftentimes, people see those green arrows and think everything's good to go and you're done. But you have to actually submit it in order for it to go through in the system. Okay. All right. With that, um, I, of course, want to remind you about the due dates. The pre-proposals are due on Monday, February 8th. Um, they need to be submitted by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it, we would then expect to send out invitations for full, full proposals somewhere um, on the week of March 7th uh, for pro full proposals being due in April. All right, so I've included some contact information here, and we'll go ahead and um, use uh, however much time we need uh, to answer any questions. I, I know we're um, just over... It's a 4.05 uh, Eastern time, so we're a little over our one hour limit here, but I'd be happy to, so feel free to jump off if you need to, but um, we will stay with you guys to, to get any questions answered that you may have. So thank you guys so much for, for attending. Courtney, do we, I imagine we probably have some questions. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a couple um, regarding match. So I'm going to try to group these together since they're similar. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, could you could you utilize already collected preliminary data costs as your match for the project, or would match have to occur at the time of the proposed project? Yeah, I think this is really going to be on a case by case basis. Will, are you on the line with us? You must have had to jump off, but um, basically there are you know we need to follow the um, OMB guidance uh, because we're receiving federal funds. Will was that you? No, oh, I thought I heard something. No. Right, no. <laughs> um, uh, do you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Oh, there you oh go. good. You'll be able to answer this much better than I can. <laughs> All right. What was the can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. So um, we have, in general, match questions regarding um, the time period that match can be used. So mm -hmm. um, someone was wondering if they could use um, preliminary costs related to this project as match for the project, or would the match have to occur at the same time of the proposed project? So the match needs to be spent within the project period. So if you had some funds done right now, you know, make sure the start date is January 1st so you can capture a batch that's happening right now. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked the same question, so I will skip that. Hopefully, Mike, that helps you out there. Um, the next question is, what sort of budget information is required in the pre-proposal? So not uh, not a lot of detail at the pre-proposal stage. Um, basically, um, on, let me backtrack here. Um, on this project information section um, of the application, um, down here at the bottom, there's this project budget section. And really, the only thing that needs to be included there is the um, total request amount for the project. Hey, if you are invited to submit a full proposal, then we will ask for a much more detailed and itemized budget. Okay, the next question is, does the monitoring plan need to include recommended metrics? Um, is a pre-proposal more competitive if it does? 
Um, certainly, metrics are always always uh, a good thing to have, and if you um, have a clear uh, methodology for how you are going to track the progress of the project, that always makes um, a proposal stronger. Now, in the at the pre-proposal stage, um, we do not ask explicitly for particular metrics. Um, if you're invited to submit a full proposal, there is a whole section dedicated to metrics. Um, but uh, certainly, if you have the room in your proposal, um, it will um, it, it will not hurt your case. Certainly, if you can provide uh, information about how you will be tracking progress and which metrics uh, you feel are appropriate for the project. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, we had a question of, can we get a copy of the presentation? Um, as we mentioned earlier, this is recorded and will be provided on um, the Fisheries Innovation Fund website. Um, as far as the actual PowerPoint, Kristen, I will let you answer whether or not that will be available. Yeah, I don't think we're going to share the actual PowerPoint presentation itself, but it really does mirror pretty closely the RFP and the tip sheet, which are which you can readily download from uh, the Fisheries Innovation Fund website. So the webinar will be available um, to, to access, uh, but again, we won't share the actual slides. Okay. We have another question here. What percentage of pre-proposals are invited to do full proposals? Yeah, so again, we don't, we don't typically provide um, detailed numbers on this. Um, so, but I can say, um, you know, last year when we uh, had $19 million in total requests at the pre-proposal stage, uh, we invited about maybe four uh, million dollars in um, total requests somewhere in that neighborhood uh, to submit full proposals. So yes, it is in a very competitive, very p competitive program, uh, both at, especially at the pre-proposal stage, but also at the full proposal stage. Okay, next we have, is it considered negative to submit more than one project pre-proposal? No, uh, not necessarily. I mean, certainly we'd want to we'd want those two projects to have very distinct scope of work. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If if your organization has multiple uh, projects they're working on that feel you feel aligned with the priorities, then by all means you can submit multiple applications. Okay. The next question is: If we have angel and VC funding, does this account as matching? Um, yeah, I, I will. I, I don't see any reason why angel investment funds could not be used uh, as match. Do you uh, have yeah, any reason why fine. they couldn't? Yeah. No, I don't know. Okay, the next question is, could you include funds in the matching section if those funds are from a state or local government um, who in turn receive those funds from a federal grant? If the funds go through the state, then they become state funds, so those are fine. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, so. Will. Okay. Um, let's see. The we'll next one is. take a few. I'm sorry, Courtney. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, oh yeah. We'll probably take a, a few more minutes of questions here. Um, but uh, again, we'd be happy to, to work with you guys um, on offline as as well. Okay, but we'll take uh, several, a few more minutes of questions here. Um, looks like I just have one more. Would the pre-proposal oh, okay. stage be an appropriate time to provide a letter of support from a federal agency? No. Um, so we don't would not encourage you to provide a bunch of additional kind of supplements to the pre-proposal. Um, we uh, do have one potential additional upload. So if you do have like a project map that you want to provide, you can upload that, and it won't count against your two-page limit. Um, but we don't want that to be used for a bunch of additional supplementary information or letters of recommendation or references or things like that. References are not required. Um, so you know, there's really no reason to use up your um, your word count on references, for instance. Um, but as far as additional uploaded documents, 
we ask that you do not submit those with the pre-proposal. If you are invited to submit a full proposal, then you will be given the opportunity to, to provide letters of support. Uh, if you do have a large number of uh, partners involved uh, who will be active with the project, I mean, certainly you'd want to mention that in the pre-proposal, but actual letters of support, um, we'd, we do not uh, need to see those at this stage. So is that all the questions? Yes, I believe we're good. Excellent. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Um, Please follow up uh, at any point if you have questions. And again, those pre-proposals are due on February 8th. So thank you all, and have a wonderful rest of the day.